Now this is just a brief introduction to congruences, that is, if you like, the arithmetic of remainders, so that you can use these in solving certain problems. First a bit of terminology about a division, which of course will result in a remainder, and that is, if I put this down, if I take some number and divide it by some other number, it will go in a certain number of times, and then there will be something left over. So I'll just put remainder, just put rem. Now each of these parts has got a name. The number you're dividing by is the divisor. The number you're dividing it into, that's the A in this case, is the dividend. Might be more aware of that in terms of that which is to be shared out, the dividend. The number of times it goes in, in other words, the number of times you can take N out of it is Q, which is called the quotient. And if there's anything left over, that'll be R, which is the remainder. And it's this thing here, the remainder, which congruences are all about with respect to this number that you're dividing by. In fact, these are given other names that signify that. The divisor is known as the modulus of this calculation that will provide a remainder. And the simplest remainder is also known as the residue, which obviously just means what's left over. Another piece of notation. If the remainder is zero, that means n divides a exactly. And the notation for that is this. n with a vertical stroke in a means n divides a. The implication being, of course, that's exactly. As an example, dividing by 3. If I take 16 and divide it by 3, that will go in 5 times and give me a remainder of 1. So you could say here, the number 16, with respect to division by n, and the word for that uses this, 16 modulo, in this case it's 3, is equal to 1. Meaning, modulo, meaning the remainder with respect to division by whatever it says there, 3. Similarly, if I had to pick another number, like 40, 40 divided by 3 would go in 13 times and also have a remainder of 1. And this is where the congruences come in now. There's another piece of notation that's used here. As far as divide by 3 is concerned, these two numbers are the same to it, because all it produces is this remainder of 1 at the end. As far as the remainder with respect to divisions concerned, as far as this module is concerned, they both give 1. They're both identical in that respect. So you can write this. You can write 40, and it's not going to be 40 is equal to 16, because it's obviously not. You write 40 is congruent to 16. Now, it's only congruent to 16 in respect of this, division with respect to 3. So in brackets afterwards, you would write modulo 3. Now, that's the classic statement in congruences. These two here are equivalent in the sense that they give the same remainder with respect to division by 3. And that simplest remainder is 1. So you could write 40 is congruent to 1 mod 3. And that's the simplest remainder, that's the residue that has to be less than the dividing number. So writing this out, this would be read as 40 is ooh, congruent to 1. Normally you just say mod, but it's actually modulo 3. Right, some rules for congruences. Take a couple here. If a number A is congruent to B, mod some number or other, and another number C is congruent to D, mod that same base. Noting that here there are no fractions involved. These are all going to be integers. A, B, C, D and N are all going to be integers. Integers, in particular, positive integers. If that's the case, then there are three worthwhile ones to remember. If A is congruent to B, 
and C is congruent to D, that means as far as this is concerned, this division is concerned, both of them would give the same remainder. These two will give the same remainder, which will be different from these two in general. Then, the first one is A plus C, in other words, adding two numbers, is congruent to B plus D mod M. These don't necessarily need to be the residues, the smallest values, but what it says effectively is the remainder of the sum is equal to the sum of the remainders. That's the addition and subtraction works as well. So there's the addition and subtraction principle. Two, any multiple of A is congruent to the same multiple of B. The remainder of the multiple equals the multiple of the remainder. And the third one, the multiplication, A times C will be congruent to B times D, mod N. The remainder of the product equals the product of the remainder. That's a very useful one because it's one that can lead to powers of numbers, the remainder after division into a power of a number. Right, as an illustration of the first one, the addition and subtraction principle, that is, the remainder of the sum, I should have said, or difference, equals the sum or difference of the remainders. We'll just pick a couple of numbers. We'll take 45 and we'll take 18. And we'll take them both, division with respect to 5, so that'll be mod 5. Well, 5 into that would go remainder 2, so that's congruent to 2 mod 5. 18 dividing by 5 would be 3, remainder 3, that's congruent to 3 mod 5. Now, adding 47 and 18 would give you 50, 65. So what's 65 congruent to? Well, dividing that by 5, it goes in exactly. So that's congruent to 0, mod 5. So how does that tie in with this principle? That if you add the numbers, then you get the addition of the remainders. Well, I'll put it down. So the equivalent statement here would be, if that and that is the case, then 47 plus 18 should be congruent to 47 is congruent to 2, 18 is congruent to 3, which is 5, but since I'm taking mod 5, that'll drop down again to 0, mod 5. The remainder of the sums is congruent to the sum of the remainders. Then an illustration of the second one, multiplying by some fixed number. You could combine it with 1 to produce a linear combination of these two. So that, for instance, I could take three of them and two of them. What would happen then to the, the remainders? It is 177. So try that. 177 is congruent to, it's easy to divide by five, is congruent to two mod five. How does that compare to this expansion? This says that three times 47 plus 2 times 18, which is of course the same as this, should be congruent to 3 times the 47, which is 2, plus 2 times whatever 18 was congruent to, which was 3, mod 5. Now that's 6 and 6, which comes to 12. We'll just put that down again. So that's congruent to 12, mod 5. And of course, divide by 5 takes that down to 2. A remainder of two. Same result. And what about the last one? The principle for multiplication. The remainder of the product is equal to the product of the remainders. Test it for this here. 47 times 18 is 846. Now, 846 is congruent to, there will be one left over dividing by 5, is congruent to 1 mod 5. Now, if 47 times 18 should be congruent to 2 times 3, which is 6, and 6 is congruent to 1. There's one left over when you divide 6 by 5. The multiplication principle. Of course, that would also extend to powers. 
If 47 is congruent to 2, mod 5, then multiplying by 47 would be equivalent to multiplying by 2, which means any power of 47 would be congruent to any power of the same power of 2. That's not quite so useful because you'd have to work out what this thing came to. It does become useful when you've got something which is congruent to 1. So, for instance, 19 is congruent to 1, not mod 5, but pick a different one, mod 9, which means 19 to the power n, any power, will be congruent to 1 to the power n, which means 19 is congruent to 1, mod 9, for any power. 19 to the power n is congruent to 1, mod 9. Continuing with the powers then, and this was what will lead to Fermat's little theorem. If a is congruent to b, then a to the n will be congruent to b to the n. Notice I've changed this to mod m now, because I want to use n for powers, which is only really useful when it's congruent to a 1, because then this just turns down into a little number, into a 1. But it turns out that if m is a prime number, if you take modulo p where p is prime, then a to the power p is congruent just to a itself without any power there. So that, for instance, 3 to the 11 mod 11. In other words, if you work out 3 to the power 11 and then divide by that by 11, the remainder should be 3. Just checking that. 3 to the power 11 is 177147. Dividing that by 11 gives you 16104.2727. And of course, you recognise that pattern of digits. That's 9 threes, so it's a remainder 3. And of course, if that's greater, then you would just take the modulo again if you would something like 9 to the power 7. Well, that should be congruent to 9 mod 7. Power's a prime number. But of course, 9 mod 7 would be congruent all the way down to 2. So that says dividing 9 to the power 7 by 7 should give a result, resulting remainder of 2. 9 to the power 7 is 4782969. Dividing that by 7 gives you a whole bundle of numbers, but 0.2857 and so on. And that's the second in the series, and that's remainder 2. Now, from this, the statement that's known as Fermat's Little Theorem is a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p, where a and p are co-prime. This little bracket here stands for the highest common factor of the numbers a and p, and if they're co-prime, they don't share any factors, so the highest common factor should be 1. If a and p are co-prime, that is, they don't share any factors, no factors in common. If a and p are co-prime, that means that a to the p minus 1 should be congruent to 1, mod p. That's Fermat's little theorem, which can be useful in some problem solving. So that, for instance, 9, if I'm going to do something mod 7, 9 and 7 are co-prime, 9 to the power 6, notice that's 1 less than this prime number, should be congruent to 1, which you can check for yourself. When you divide that number by 7, you do in fact get 1. But the handy thing here, of course, is sometimes those numbers you haven't got access to because they become so big. If that congruence applies, then so does 9 to the power 6 raised to any power. Would still be congruent to 1, 
because 1 to any power remains at 1. And that's the useful one for it finding the remainder of fairly huge numbers. As an example, what's the remainder when 3 to the power 1, 2, 3 is divided by 11? Yeah, no problem, I'll just type that in and see what the remainder is. 3 to the power 1, 2, 3 is, whoops, gubbed. There you go. Far too many digits here to fit, in, fit on it, so I've no idea what they are at the end, so I can't actually divide that by 11. If I try dividing it by 11, I'll still have no idea what I've got at the end. So that's where Fermat's little theorem's going to come in handy. If I'm dividing by 11, which is a prime number, so if I'm going to do modulo 11, and 3 is co-prime, so it should work fine, that means 3 to the 11 minus 1, 3 to the power 10 should be congruent to 1. Now you can just use those multiplication rules for congruences to construct this. So, 3 to the 1, 2, 3 is equal to 3 to the 10 raised to the power 12, that's power 120, multiplied by another 3 lots of 3, 3 to the power 3. And I'll continue with the congruences, so I'll put that in there. So that should be congruent to... Well, 3 to the 10 is congruent to 1, so that's congruent to 1 to the 12. 3 to the power of 3, I'll just multiply that out, 3, 9, 27. Now, 1 to the 12 is just 1, and 27, 11 into 27 is 2 remainder 5, so that's 5 mod 11. The answer to the question is, the remainder equals 5. And that's one example of a type of question where you can use Fermat's little theorem. And also an example of using congruences. Now, congruences are also very handy in establishing divisibility. But this has already gone on long enough probably, so I'll make another video on divisibility, proving some of them using congruences.